What up, what up? Welcome back to the Sneaker History Podcast. My name is Nick Ingvall with my guys, Mike and Rowett. Talk some kicks. Yeah. What's good, fellas? Not too much, man. You know, just just living a dream. Just out here trying to trying to actually clean my office and get rid of some stuff. But you know, it is what it is. Yep. Another sunny day here in Portland. So I'm <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, ever since ever since I started getting to know Road, I realized that the weather in Portland has dr- dramatically changed for the better. <laughs> Power of positive thinking. Power of positive thinking. <laughs> it's the secret. It's every self help book that your mom was trying to read while she was going through some things in middle school. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah. chicken soup for the soul. Is that what I'm hearing right now? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So many damn flavors of chicken soup now that I wonder if the, like what's the modern day equivalent like what's the twelve year old today reading for in terms of like a substitute for chicken soup for the kids soul read. because I remember those they kids were so popular and I was like we really have the Lifetime Channel in book form with these things like yep. that's what that I was kind of thought of yeah well it's crazy too because like I think like podcasts are that for me right mm-hmm. although. I'm also a big audiobook guy. So, oh, okay. I mean, I have probably 40 or 50 books on on Audible that I listen to. This is not a plug or anything, but like it's just like the <laughs> default easy thing to use for me. But I I I go through and like if I'm if like I'm in a spot where I know I can get through a like a, a serious amount of things like taking a long walk with the dog or a run or something like that, I can plug in for an hour or more. Mm-hmm. I'll definitely go towards an audiobook, which in that case like you know, those types of books, I think it's just, you know, a matter of finding the people. It's the same thing as like listening to podcasts, right? You just find the people that you resonate with. Like for me, like I would, I would say the four hour work week is a hundred percent. Like, you know, if I had a Bible, that's the Bible to me because it's all about just changing the mindset of like the regular working nine to five for another company. And it's not necessarily about working four hours a week. It's just creating like creative ways to, to make money that you can then turn and, and do the things that you love. And I mean, really like, that's like this podcast for me. It's like, I'd, I'd rather be doing this on a regular basis. You know, not that we don't do it on a regular basis, but like, imagine if all of us made our living doing this podcast, how much fun it would be to get create more creative with it because we wouldn't have the day job that we had to deal with for a pri- most of our day. So um, yeah, it's, that's kind of interesting though. I mean, I'm 100% with you on on the secret and the positivity though because yeah especially especially in my experience with Portland so up until 3 years ago so I well full transparency I lived in Salem Oregon as a kid and Roseburg Oregon as a kid and you know so I'm 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 tossing that out of this little analogy but I I I went to Portland probably I don't know 50 times in you know, the 2005 to 2021 era or 2020, I guess. And probably like, I I would just like mentally think like, it's going to be sunny. It's got like, I picture Michael on the billboard. Welcome to sunny Portland. (laughs) And no, no kidding. Like there was an era when I worked at finish line that like a bunch of the people that were on my team, went to Portland for like a two year stretch and they had never seen rain in Portland. And I was like, that's crazy. So I totally believe in that. It sounds, you know, super corny at times, but I love corny too. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the, I'm the guy making the the cheesy jokes. Yeah, exactly. I'm the guy making the cheesy jokes in the house. So, (laughs) um, but anyway, welcome to sunny Portland. Welcome to sunny sneaker history podcast. (laughs) <laughs> Dude, that should be an intro thing from now on. Oh. Um, but <laughs> but uh let's uh let's let's talk about what are you guys rocking, what are you guys copping? Yeah, man. So when I'm rocking, I mean I get to pull a Nick Ingvall a day. I get to, I never get to do this, but Uh-oh. now I get to, I'm really excited. <laughs> so I got it was sent to me by the nice people over at uh Foot Locker and then Way of Wade and the Create Agency. It is an unreleased pair of Way of Wade eights. It's actually a pair you saw on Twitter. It was hit for, uh, you know, against minority injustice uh, during in, during June of last year. He brought these out on Twitter. And, yeah, dude, these things are fully 3M. So I don't have, my like, my flashlight on. But if you can uh, – you can't really see in the camera. But they're completely 3M. And, dude, these are sick. 
Like I don't wanna, yeah, like this is one of pairs like I want to wear them just sh like show how they feel, but I kind of want to glass case them and just look at them all the time. So, <laughs> yeah, dude, super excited about these. And um, Coppin, I, I just told Roy before we started recording, I am literally dead laser set on the Kobe Six All Star. Some things may fall into place and it may happen. So fingers crossed. Hopefully we have good news soon. Oh, no, that's awesome. Uh, I know for a lot of us watching you struggle through these Kobe releases, we just made <laughs> hit on one pair. And just me, why? it's going to be the quality of release, not the quantity for young Michael. And we're here for that. So yes, as for sir. me, I'll use that as a segue. I am rocking. And by rocking, I mean, yes. I put these on 30 seconds so I could justify talking about them on the <laughs> podcast. The Bruce and the Alternate Fives, they are sick. I'm glad I purchased them. Uh, I love the myth making as we've kind of covered in previous episodes. I think Kobe's always done a great job with it. And for me, what I'm copying or what I'm hoping to cop and I'll go a little off the beaten path. Cause I didn't know, um, Nick, you're a big Nipsey hustle guy. Are you aware that there's a Jay-Z Nipsey hustle song coming out on Friday? Yeah, I'm super what? stoked. <laughs> oh yeah. So there's a movie that's getting a lot of Oscar buzz called Judas and the black Messiah. Yes. I believe yeah. it deals with the murder black of a black man. Or chairman mm -hmm. is that accurate mike he sounds about right yeah but i mean it's been getting a lot of buzz it's got a lot of good actors in it uh it's got daniel kalua i hope i'm pronouncing your name correctly and then it's also <laughs> got lakeith stanfield who i yeah. think is basically the spiritual successor to samuel l jackson in the fact that i think from this point on we're gonna see him in four movies a year and we're just gonna be like how the hell is continuing to get worse it keeps working <laughs> Keeps working, large range of roles. So I'm not mad at that. But the fact that we got the Jay Z Nipsey Hustle song and it's called What It Feels Like, I'm just excited for that. So I will spend my dollar twenty nine on Apple just because the marathon will always continue. And as a member of Rock Nation, we want to show support. So <laughs> Nick, what are you rocking? What are you copping? Um, so actually the last like few days I posted on on uh our Discord. I, I I broke out the Jordan three black cements and uh, as typically what happens when I pull out a shoe like that, that I for years and, you know, was infatuated with, I almost never put anything else on. So I think it's been like six days straight now of wearing that shoe. Um, just, you know, taking the dog out, nothing, nothing too crazy. I haven't even been to like a grocery store or anything in, in that time, but um, that, that I don't know what it is about, the Jordan three, but like, it just, there's just something about that shoe. That's like, mm -hmm. okay. In full transparency though, it is not comfortable compared to most other shoes that I own now. Right. Modern technology is so much Fair. better, but the Jordan three, ah, God, I love the way that shoe looks and the feeling that you get putting it on is still like, <laughs> exactly. It's still like, <laughs> just, do, just does it for me, man. Um, but Shout out to to Pete Hall from our, our Discord group. Um, my pickup this week, Yay. long time coming, finally scored the Kobe Yellow Toe Reebok questions. Woo! I uh, yeah, I I I'm just speechless, Wait. man. I've literally been waiting for that shoe. Uh, I've probably talked about it on this before, but the Yellow Toe question mid that came out in like 2001 nine. 99, 2000, 2001, somewhere in there is one of the only like original first five year questions that I didn't get. So um, this one is the Kobe version of that, which is that much better. Um, yeah. And as I was telling Mike and wrote before we started recording, it's just it's tough because, man, I want to wear them, but I also don't want to mess them up because I just want to admire them for a while, too. So <laughs> until the rain is uh, until Sacramento is as sunny as Portland. I'm going to just <laughs> admire them. But eventually, they will definitely be getting worn. Probably, um, I, I, I don't necessarily wear Lakers jerseys, but I could I could definitely go for a, a Kobe jer jersey at this point. So maybe that'll even happen. Dude. No, I mean, I think that, that is the thing with Kobe, right? The sneaker history, shameless plug, of Kobe's <laughs> off years where you've got the questions – 
you have his Jordan three and that I think what what did the Jordan three pair with? Was it an eight, eight. that was gonna come out? But then yeah. apparently Travis Scott was the only person that ever ended up with those. He just has a great what if when it comes to his catalog. Mm-hmm. And I really hope we get to see more of those pairs that we only dream about because we see them as pictures in a sneaker history or a soul collector post. So Kudos for you, man. I, I, yeah, that man. smile is radiating off your face, Nick. I'm so happy for you. It's a win for the sneaker history family right here. She's like, <laughs> Seriously. I mean, I, and and shout out to the Discord, right? Like, there's been people that have been trying to look out. Uh, like, some some of the guys are like, ah, oh, you can have mine. I don't know if I'm going to end up wearing them. And some of the guys had sizes that I couldn't quite, quite squeeze. But, you know, Pete, like, worked the magic, found them rest- found that they restocked and, and just was like, I'm going to grab them for you. And like doing it that way, I don't I don't have to pay extra shipping or anything. So it's like literally like retail straight from the retailer as opposed to the other folks helping me out would have been like an extra 20 bucks or 30 bucks to get it to and from, you know, them. So, I mean, just yeah, like to like I, I guess like because I'm I'm just programmed, right? We've taken so many L's along the way that you just don't see things come around this <laughs> late usually for retail like usually at this yeah, point yeah. you're like all right i gotta pay that extra 20 30 whatever that markup is so shout out to pete and i, I mentioned it before but pete has yeah. a, a new streetwear brand called guilty goods and i don't want to like tell his story but like yeah. definitely check out his page the the reason behind the brand is super dope and i'm very supportive of him he's a really good dude and i think like the the, the purpose behind it and the reason why he's doing it is admirable so i think you know if you want to check that out uh i think it's guiltygoods.us on instagram something like that um i'll look it up but is this the same keith that has the greatest nickname in our discourse which is keith (laughs) de no this is uh this is uh pete let's see oh pete what is his okay yeah i'm 55 sorry bad hearing Still, Keith the Sneak, you have the best nickname in all of our Discord because of it's yeah. fantastic. your location in San Francisco and your love of hyphy music. That's my one Discord shout out. True, true. <laughs> yeah. Um, Pete is actually so I think uh his his screen name before he put his real name in there was Kimmy Gibblers. Which uh I can't remember. Is that the um, I remember that that's one. the girl from uh Full yeah, House. like Full house, yeah, yeah, which is just like great, right? <laughs> so yeah, I saw that as soon as so, I entered the room, I was like, "That's perfect." I don't know who this is, yeah. but this is perfect. <laughs> yeah, so so if you're interested in the Discord Patreon, uh, like Patreon.com/slash Sneaker History, yes, it's about sneakers, but we also have some uh, some Full House references. We've got an entire Golden Girls channel because why wouldn't we have a Golden <laughs> Girls channel? Um, yeah, it's just a it's just a fun time. So shout out to all the people that are supporting and in our Discord because hey, seriously, like Will Effing Farrell, like what a name! Like there's so many great screen names in there too. That's the best part. Sometimes I like to just hang out there, not even say anything. I just like kind of like to watch the messages go by because it's pure entertainment. <laughs> Yeah. Listen, I, I mean, I will also speak up. We had a pretty lit WandaVision conversation Yo. in the TV movie. <laughs> uh, let's just say there's a lot of speculation and a lot of theories. And this is when you kind of feel glad that you're in a part of a message board where it's still not too big and it hasn't hit that critical mass yet. And you know everybody because inside jokes are forming. Real friendships are there. So that oh, yeah. there's yep. our shape. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so s- switching it up, I think we've got a, a pretty – Good review to read, right, Rowan? We do. We will go ahead and read that review. It's from The Neils 2010, and its title is Old School Sneakerhead. Love this podcast. I'm a 40-something sneakerhead and love the history. I appreciate you guys giving honest opinions and the history. I enjoy learning the history as well as staying up on, staying up to date as much as possible. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Old School Sneakerhead. And I must say this, the use of history, we appreciate it because it gives us that brain synergy we love so much. So thank you again. Yeah, man. Appreciate that comment. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I was just looking at, at at the reviews the other day and like realizing we're we're only seven episodes away from number two hundred. So no pressure, but we got to. We gotta, I mean, I feel like we got a we got a show for for two hundred. That's a that's an accomplishment. So coming soon, I guess. <laughs> oh man, it just. 
No, we're definitely going to be thinking about what's what are we rocking and copping for that episode because that's uh, going to be historic. <laughs> oh, see, I got a yep. joke from one of our our discussions from earlier for our next topic. I'm like, I could probably we'll, we'll say that for another episode. <laughs> I don't want to give away for the next topic, but it made me laugh in in my brain. All right. <laughs> so so one of the things. Thing? Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, what do we have first? So before we get into the the, the main topics, I wanted to just start kind of uh, talking about some of the things that, that went down in this week in history. So, um, you know, you're, you're probably going to listen to this towards the end of the week, but early in the week, uh, MJ became the oldest All-Star Game MVP back in 98. Uh, Spud Webb won the dunk contest back in, what, 86 in those ponies. Uh, the Yeezy two red October dropped on a Sunday, 2014 randomly. Um, Lynn sanity had his, uh, Jeremy Lynn had his career high on the 10th of February in 2012, which is insane to think that that was nine years ago. I, I like, it's kind of mind blowing. I feel ancient because of that. Um, <laughs> you got a, a handful of birthdays. Uh, Ben McLemore is born on February the 11th, Bill Russell, February the 12th, Randy Moss, February 13th. Uh, what else we got? We got, uh, oh, the Vince Carter dunk contest, February 12th. Mm. We're getting into a lot of, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the all-star weekend memories as, as you get towards the end of this week. So, um, we'll, we'll leave it at that though. And just say that we'll be we'll be talking about a lot of these things on the Instagram account this week and on the Twitter account this week, I'm sure. So, sure. but as for the main topics, I think uh, we've got a handful of of interesting topics, but they all also can kind of roll into like a bigger conversation almost. Um, but before we get into that bigger conversation, I think that we should probably talk about the Super Bowl. Uh, my condolences, Rowett. I know this was this was a tough year, but as a 49ers fan, you know I, I've been there recently multiple times and and felt that same pain. So I will say this: it was very easy to be a gracious loser because of the amount of 49er fans in my life, including one Nick Engvall. So it wasn't <laughs> one of those things that I was particularly salty, other than the fact that the quarterback of the team that shall not be named. Nah, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they did fantastic. It's really the quarterback I don't like, and that's just for me being petty. They had a plan. Uh, they punched us in the mouth, and like the old Mike Tyson quote goes, we didn't have a plan, apparently, because once we got hit in the mouth, it was just, okay, let's just get to the end of this game. That being said, <laughs> trying to be the eternal, sunshiny Portland dude that I am, I will say this. Three of the greatest incomplete passes I've ever seen in a Super Bowl <laughs> I give you that. And I know it's petty, and I know it's cl uh, cl grasping, clutching at straws. It's maybe a participation trophy, but when my quarterback, and I will say my quarterback, Patrick LaVon Mahomes II, Call has it no pass, <laughs> and people forget the LaVon. The LaVon is <laughs> as important as the Patrick. <laughs> I celebrate Black History Month, and Patrick Mahomes is doing wonders for the community. <laughs> Not only for the black community, the white community, the Indian community, he's bringing all of us together because my man looks like he's playing a different sport half the time. He had traces of Quidditch in his game yesterday because he, no joke, I would say this, the most famous sports photograph where an athlete is completely parallel is that old Dennis Rodman shot, mm -hmm. right? Where he's extending He's straight out, yeah. Ball. The Superman in a sense. Yep. Patrick Mahomes said, nah, bruh, let me go ahead and get sideways, sitting sideways, because my man's from Houston and we have to pay respect to the chop and the go. screwed. And he flicked that ball like Jose Altuve to first, and it hit the dude in the face. And I honestly think the receiver, I think it was one of the Williams boys, just didn't realize it was coming because he had no time to adjust. And it's moments like that that let me know that this is something special. And if this is the end of his Dan Marino run where we're never going to go to another Super Bowl, I'll be upset about it, but it's moments like that where I'm like, I have seen the future of the game. It is Patrick Mahomes. I don't know if I can ever go back. I may retire when he retires because he just played <laughs> absurdity. But anyway, thank you for giving me my platform. <laughs> Dude, he's playing and one football out there. I mean, that's the best way to call it. 
he don't miss. <laughs> yeah. He, when I saw him get pulled down by the legs and still muster up upper body strength to chunk this thing perfect spiral, and the receiver's like, what? Like, that was, it was pure surprise by the, the receiver to be like, I didn't think he was actually going to throw it to me. Uh, that's my bad. But, uh, no, it, yeah. I well, had no dog and, in and the I fight. Saw... <laughs> yeah, so that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I didn't either. I mean, I am not like really a big football fan at this point. Like, I'm just kind of over the NFL's lack of yeah. lack of honesty. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I saw a stat. I was going to see if I could find it real quick, but I can't. I can't seem to find it. But I, I saw a stat basically that said something along the lines of. Uh, that Patrick Mahomes uh, ran for s- like some ridiculous amount of yardage prior to like throwing, like prior to oh, passing yeah. or or being sacked. Right? He got and it was like so much. <laughs> yeah, and it was like, wait, he rushed for how much without actually getting credit for it? And I can't remember what it was, but it was like in the hundreds I'm of yards, right? I believe it. He was literally going back every every drop back he was getting destroyed out there just people like his o-line was non-existent we had yeah, no o-line yeah. it was absurd but yeah like my man is untouchable like elliot ness it's <laughs> i don't know how to explain oh, it he... because go for it okay so according to next gen stats patrick mahomes ran a total of 497 yards before his passes and sacks yes dude like just and to Brady, put that into what? perspective, not only was he making impossible throws, he also rushed for more yards than either of those teams collectively would have rushed without him in There's like no... the last three weeks. <laughs> yeah. And Nick, hit him with the Tom Brady rushing stat equivalent because that's the more job. Happened. <laughs> three. He rushed for three. <laughs> was it really three? I don't. I don't know. Have it in front of me, but yeah, I, I think it was thirty-two yards because he would just <laughs> yeah. simply drop back and find and. From a tactical perspective, this is maybe where I show my ignorance because I thought coming into the Super Bowl, the Chiefs line was as mangled as it can be. And I thought we were going to get a heavy dose of jet sweeps and we're going to get a heavy dose of that West Coast short passes. Wasn't the case. Don't know where the offense is. But like I said, if you're going to be bad, be memorable. And the Chiefs line was bad. The referees were bad. Patrick Mahomes was not bad. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Yeah. I I I will say this. And this goes to your point, Nick. He saved my football watching career because I was ready to give up when Kaepernick was getting blackballed by the league. Let's call a spade a spade. And I think it's very disingenuous that there was a certain NFL commercial that talked about how much money they're donating to civil rights causes. And you still can't give that man a proper opportunity, emphasis on being proper. So it's very disingenuous. But I am also one of the hypocrites that's feeding the beast because I will buy every piece of Patrick Mahomes related memorabilia. So. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, well, that's the interesting thing about sports, right? Like there's so many situations where I think you you have to, especially in a pandemic, right? Like the, the entire, you know, world usually watch the entire United States, I should say, watches the Super Bowl and definitely doesn't always, uh, you know, you, you don't always have the reasoning behind it like you do this year where like, look, people are looking for a little mental vacation that usually comes around with the Super Bowl, right? Whether that's the game itself or the commercials or all the stuff surrounding it. It's it's just a it's you know it's an entertaining weekend of of things. And I think that it's really tough when, you know, the s- same kind of thing with with sports where it's really tough when your team, you know, gets one of those once in a lifetime players that brings that excitement. You know, it's not like I you know, it's it's not like I, I could hold that against you as a, as a Chiefs fan, right? Like, yeah. look, it. I grew up watching Christian Okoye. Like, I, I I can't imagine waiting for that excitement to come back around. You know, so uh, yeah, it's it's totally fair. I th- yeah, Nick, I just, you had Jason Williams. What's that? No, I was gonna say you. For me, you had Jason Williams because I was not a basketball fan until I saw Jason Williams throw his first behind the back court yeah. pa- or behind the back pass on the court. And then Mike, like I said, I I have a feeling Deshaun Watson's gonna stay there because I think, in all transparency, draft day, I was really upset that we picked this kid named Mahomes up because Watson was right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I 
think it's going to stay kind of like they're, they're hopefully they can figure out how to patch it up with the new coach. But uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see. I haven't had excitement in a, in a while when it comes to sports. So I'm just out here just, I don't know, watching, uh, Creating watching, your own watching excitement. Australian Open right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm watching Australian Open right now. I, I'm, I'm like, look, I'm back into this. Let's go. Who, Nadal, you back in this thing? What's up? So, hey, shout out to Serena for bringing out the Flojo vibes with the like dude, the one leg. That was leg. so dope. <laughs> <laughs> dude, I was just watching. I was like, did she just come out with the with the Flojo? Like, what, what's happening right yeah. now? Well, she did. Yeah, that was, I will that say was this. Awesome. This is something I was kind of thinking. I'd use you guys, my sneaker gurus in life. Correct me if I'm wrong. The only sneaker related commercial we saw during the entire Super Bowl was Skechers. Correct. Yeah, why is it that more? H- yeah, sorry. Why isn't more companies using that time? Because I would feel that Nike or Audi in a lesser light would kill it in that spotlight. Is it just something that it's too much to put an ad up at that time, or do they think that's not what their core demographic would be? They don't have to because that's- a, I think you're right about the core demographic. It's mostly people who are buying their shoes from uh, you know famous footwear. Not not knocking that at all, but that's the customer who they're going to get regardless. And at the same time, sneakerheads are going to get regardless. They're going to see the branding on jerseys, cleats, whatever it may be, the T-shirt to end. They've already got the advertisement built in. I feel like they're not – they probably don't feel like they're wasting any more money. Yeah, I think I think with Nike too, the other side of that conversation, if you're working at Nike and, and making those types of decisions is do you want to align with the NFL that blatantly on the Super Bowl when clearly you've been aligned with Colin Kaepernick and his initiatives – you know, kind of where those those they, those two sides should not be on opposite sides, right? But but in mm-hmm. the way that consumers take it, they absolutely are, and that's unfortunate. But um, it, it is kind of funny. Like I, I was thinking about that once you once you sent that text earlier, and I just thought I can't remember too many like sneaker related commercials that have ever been a part of the Super Bowl. You know, like I think StockX through like Quicken Loans had an appearance or something. Somebody's wearing a hat or a shirt or you know, somehow was connected to a commercial within the last four or five years. Um, but it's, it's really interesting too, because that part of the business for Nike or Adidas is, or, or Reebok or anybody, right? Like that casual, you know, not to pick on people that don't know what shoes or what, right. But like the casual consumer that, that like walks into a foot locker and goes, Oh, the Club C looks cool. The Nike Air Max 90 looks cool. And I could probably wear those, you know, Adidas Boost things. And like, that's the type of consumer that's watching the Super Bowl, right? Like, yeah. the person that doesn't know what they're looking for is watching the Super Bowl. And there's a lot of opportunity there. I think I would guess that that everybody's kind of leaning more on, at least this year, would lean more on the, you know, the you know, social injustices and and where that kind of plays out mm. for the consumer, right? Because there's definitely a lot of people that are, you know, kind of land on my side of the coin with with their views on the NFL, where it's like, it's really, it's really difficult for me to get excited about the NFL. Most definitely. You know, I was a big Kaepernick fan, like he, you know, he literally grew up a, in a school, you know, in the, in the high school that competed against my cousin, you know, like, I, like went to college up in Reno, which is where one of my best friends went to school. Like I have like, I've like his journey has been right there along, you know, kind of Bay area sports in Sacramento and Sacramento and the, the Valley even, but sa- same thing with like Jeremy Lin that I mentioned about Lin Sanity, right? Like h- him as a, as a basketball player in high school was like the talk of, of, you know, high school sports when he was in the Bay area. And I think those are the those are the hardest parts for me to kind of overlook when people get blackballed, right? Because although Kaepernick is like the kind of the the quintessential example of these situations that happen, it happens a lot in sports, right? You see people that ultimately end up going and playing in China or, you know, just retire from the league when they're clearly still capable of playing the game, whatever yeah. that sport is. And it's just, it's really unfortunate, but like, as a, as a, like, I'm just like a super diehard fan too. So like, I take all those things personally when it's against somebody that I'm a fan of. Right. Like, yeah. like I I'm, I'm like, you know, I, I look at like the people, the guys that I'm a fan of, or the, the athletes that I'm a fan of the same way that I look at you guys and like, look, if somebody 
attacks you guys, I'm not messing with that person, right? Like, it's done. Like, I'm going to have my words with them. And, like, look, you know, that's it. Like, I I can't accept anything. And I just am that way with my friends and with my sports teams, I guess. Um, So... Yeah, that's a that's a that's a super long winded answer, but I, I do think that's an interesting point, and I think I think it would be really cool to see sneaker companies take more risk on those massive commercial levels, right? But yeah. I also don't think that they, with the exception of Nike, Nike's aspirational commercials would fit in certain circumstances, mm-hmm. but they also will make way more of an impact online and go viral in that sense without having to spend that money too. So to Mike's point, you yeah. know, it's like they already have Makes the, sense. they're already getting that message to the people they want to get it to. I mean, to be honest, I watched the Super Bowl to see what, uh, what Marvel trailers were coming out. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I was like Falcon winter soldier. Uh, what else can we get? Uh, you're going to give me something about, you know, Spider-Man or something, but Hey, I was cool with that. The little justice league teaser. Uh, if you guys can't connect with me on June, uh, I'm sorry, on March 18th, because I'm watching a four-hour Justice League movie, by the way. Hey, don't mind I'll me. watch it right alongside you. <laughs> you. You are the Falcon to my Winter Soldier, or vice versa. That's how we and go. Nick is Captain America, and Robbie is Loki. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, but... So, in, a, in other... Uh, I mean, I guess in sneaker news, sneaker-related news... Um, Rowett Rowett had a had a great question, you know, like talking about the Carmines, what makes the shoe so special, standout moments in them, personal memories that that we associate with those shoes, um, which I think kind of rolls into like a much bigger topic around nostalgia that we want to talk mm-hmm. about because um, the prices of like game worn shoes, game worn equipment, like vintage stuff is just skyrocketing. And yeah, um, I wrote about this a little bit on the Sneaker Throne blog this week but it's it's really fascinating to see you know i i think um i think nick DePaula posted that heritage auctions uh I, I might be wrong but i think it's heritage auctions has the the kobe american flags that lebron wore uh up Ooh. for auction right now which is you know if you look at Aside from the obvious like Nike versus Adidas conversation that comes with a shoe that, you know, somebody wore in their early days, th- those types of things are kind of can kind of be connected to like this boom in the sports card trading card world. And I think that when when it's all said and done, a shoe like that is going to end up being really, really crazy expensive. I think the bids that I saw so far were 13 to 15 grand or something like that. On the flip it's, side, go ahead. It's currently at fifteen thousand five hundred dollars. Yeah, and so and I, and I think that there were less than thirty pairs, if I remember right. It's either less than thirty or less than forty that were made. Most of them in in Kobe's size fourteen. Uh, that particular, I don't know if that particular pair was gifted to LeBron or not, or if it was just another sample. But either way, the nostalgia around Kobe and LeBron and their relationship started at that point, right? So. That shoe, for the next generation of, of sneakerhead, if they know what that shoe is, or a- as as we get to whatever LeBron's last dance moment is in 10, 15 years, that shoe is going to be worth exponentially whatever somebody pays for it right now. Because on the flip side of that, we have the Jordan 1 that's on eBay for a million dollars, which is a, uh, you know, a... TYPS, uh, yeah, TYPS uh, sample, which basically is like, uh, you know, made specifically for Michael Jordan. One of them's a size 13, one of them size 13 and a half. This is an unworn pair in incredible condition. It also has Michael's autograph on the toe. But what a lot of collectors look at is like early autographs from Michael Jordan look way different than older autographs, right? As a player ages, their autograph gets less and less uh, detailed because they're just hurrying through all of those things. Whereas a rookie, he's probably excited, taking his time, you know, like this is like a, a probably he's, you know, obviously had success in the Olympics and college, but like, you're still, you're still like enjoying the moment of like signing an autograph in a lot of ways. Right. 
And that one has the certification. There's a lot of things that make that shoe incredibly valuable. Not to mention, we've seen the Jordan 1 sell for five, six dollars $600,000 recently. But we're just in a really weird place with this. And I think talking about new releases, we also have Trophy Room basically trying to replicate that exact experience of like, how do we how do we get this nostalgia that happened 20 what is it 36 years ago now with you know Michael Jordan's first All-Star game so yeah. the last thing I'll say in regards to all of those things and how they come together my my love for the carmines comes from the simple fact that they are the very first shoe that I can remember that was a primarily red shoe. Like mm. there were, there were Chicago's white, red, black. There were, you know, black and red Jordan ones. Like there were, you know, various Jordan fives and, and stuff along the way, but the original shoes stuck to very simple colorways, right? Like, you know, if you think of like what Jordans look like up until the five or six came out, like a true blue or a military blue four, was like a crazy colorway and they're not crazy at all by those standards. So the Carmine to me always stood out because it was like the first time you ever saw like an actual different colorway. Not to, not to mention that the red is actually not traditional Chicago bulls red, which made it even cooler. So um, that, that was kind of like the first thing I thought of when you, when you sent that question, but I'll, I'll toss it to you guys. And, and I know I just spilled all my thoughts at one time, but nah, man. feel free to pick and choose how to respond to either <laughs> of those, any of those. <laughs> well, first thing I'm going to laugh because I know you didn't do it on purpose, but just the way my brain works, the way you put replicate and trophy room in the same sentence, you sly dog, <laughs> all those fake trophy rooms out there. Um, <laughs> but uh, I have no personal, like I'd never had the shoe, but I remember as I started getting older, getting more internet access and seeing, you know, we, we talked about watching Cribs on TV, seeing people's shoes collections. The Carmine 6 was one of those shoes that a lot of people had as, like, staples in their collections. And I remember just seeing more and more of it. I was like, man, this is a cool shoe. Uh, as someone who was up and coming and getting collected, like, man, I got to have that shoe one day. It's really, you know, something I think that, you know, it, it's cool. I mean, that's, that's pretty much clean and simple. Just a kid who is trying to learn more about the sneaker culture, and that's something you just keep seeing over and over, is kind of just ingrained in me. Not, you know, really having it, oh, this is, they've only retro it X amount of times. Purely, I go back to my, what, 15, 16 year old self and say, like, I just think it's a good looking shoe. And, you know, I care. I don't care if it's Nike Air or the Jumpman on the back. I just think it's just awesome. So I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty simple when it comes to, to my thoughts on it and why I want it. Totally fair. I always just thought it was interesting because how I've always engaged in conversations with our fellow sneakerheads, the three, four, five runway, if we want to call it that, has always held a special place in a lot of people's hearts. But, and correct me if I'm wrong, his first title was with the six, obviously mm -hmm. second, seven, third, eight. We don't want to talk about what happened in those two years. <laughs> it's almost in the sense that if these titles weren't associated with these particular lines of shoe, meaning the six, seven, eight, you guys think there would be a similar resonance to them? Because I almost always hear them brought up as that point that you had made, Mike, where it's like, yeah, this is Jordan's first shoe that he wore when he won the title. And this one in particular, because I was reading up on it, almost served as a bridge because they said he used this for the victory lap after the first title and then mm -hmm. played in it all the way up until maybe the All-Star game break yeah. for that 92 season. And then that's historically when Jordan would debut the next version of his sneaker and he'd play the second half in that new sneaker. Is that accurate? I'm going to lean on Nick for this one. I feel like it's right from looking at all the historical like videos and things that people talk about it, but I lean on you for that, Nick. <clears throat> yeah, I don't remember specifically, but yeah, like I think generally speaking, yes. So that's just interesting to me because I think now having the hindsight of having three of my sneaker big brothers kind of shape some of my preferences on this sneaker – I see the beauty of a six and I look at it slightly different than when I was first kind of dabbling in the sneakerhead waters because yeah, it was a three, it was a four and it was the 11 for me. And then I grew to love the 12 and the 13, but six is a lovely thing. And I do think there is something special about this red because I can't think of another sneaker that has the same shade of red. That's almost blood red, but not really. Yeah. yeah. 
trying to yeah and i and i think i think that also plays into kind of my personal nostalgia for it too because it just it it i mean it sounds cheesy now that we've had thousands of colorways of jordans right but like it stood out to me like the 23 socks the you know just the whole vibe of that shoe was so different and like bold compared to most of the Jordans that we had seen. Right. And I know that the colors on the ones were, you know, fairly straightforward, you know, and, and very like, you know, very equally distributed colors, right. On the panels and such, but everything else for the Jordans was, you know, up until that point was, was almost like, it sounds bad and I don't mean to d- downplay the, the, you know, that runway into the six. Right. But like they didn't have a lot of like bold colorways. Right. It was, it was definitely on the safer side in terms of the colors that were chosen. And that could, ha- that could be a number of things, right. That could be Nike saying, look, people aren't ready for all these crazy colors could be Nike saying, look, the NBA is not going to let you wear this stuff anyway. You know, I, I oftentimes wonder where the dress code conversation comes in, right? Because the story we've been told around the, you know, banned ones is that the shoe was banned because it was primarily black and red, which all the shoes had to re- had to have white with team colors as accents. Yeah. There's never been any conversation around when that rule changed, right? Or when that rule yeah. went away, because obviously the shoes changed pretty drastically throughout those years. Like even just right out of, you know, 85, 86, right. I can think of like Terry Porter in Portland wearing like, you know, almost all red, like literally like an all red, uh, I think, what is he air force two? Maybe. Um, I think of like magic's converse weapon where like that shoe is, you know, primarily yellow with Mm -hmm. purple and white accents. Um, and, and it's just really interesting to me that there's that like those conversations never bubble up anywhere because I part part of me is like just second guessing whether the story of the bands is how much truth there is to it versus you know what it just was a great marketing ploy for Nike, but I think because the the Carmine specifically like I am I'm not as typically as much of a fan as of red shoes as other colorways, like a hundred percent, like the black and infrared six is, is my favorite, but the Carmine was so different in my mind. It stuck out. Like I can, I can remember like there's a, there's a, a shot that Jordan hits that is like coming down the lane and he like kind of falls backwards and throws it like over the back of his head, like, Ha- like just past the free throw line falling over and like banks it in and gets an and you know gets the and one and like that is like burned into my memory of like oh this is what you do when you drive down the lane and actually get blocked you spin your body in an impossible position and throw it up behind your head and like that was the carmine six for me is like if i you know as a kid i thought if i could get the carmine sixes then i would have definitely hit more of those shots when i was you know attempting them but um <laughs> it's it's uh it's really interesting to wait, to see, you know, the nostalgia side of that conversation come back around too. Um, there's been, there's been so much buzz around the shoe because it's the first time you're getting it. You know, the first time they came out, what, 2014, right? 20, 2013, 2014, 2014 with the you jump know, man. 2014. Yeah. With the jump man. Right. And, and now you're getting a chance to buy the shoes true to original form or at least close to it. And that's, Actually, I think what has gotten more buzz outside of sneakers, because I've seen people like Chicago sports writers writing about, you know, the the Carmine's coming back. And that to me is like this, this weird anomaly that I wonder if, if other athletes will ever be able to latch onto because yeah. MJ gets to, to revisit that part of it. Yeah. You could say that it's, you know, the, the last dance or whatever, but like, Oh, yeah. It always happens, right? Like it, it's like if it's all original and everybody latches onto the idea that it's all original, then that story spreads well beyond the traditional sneaker world, 
and story spreads into the sports, the nostalgia, the memories, and even people that, you know, like, like we were talking about the Super Bowl. I think because the colorway is so like, it just pops so much. Like if you walked into a, a, a Foot Locker, you know, whatever it is, 1991, 20, 30, 30 years ago, right? That shoe is going to look way different than everything else that's on the wall. And for sure. even if you're the consumer that's normally shopping for, you know, the Monarchs or the average kind of, you know, mid-level price points, that shoe probably still sticks out because you probably remember seeing it when you walked into the store as a kid or, you know, potentially when you saw the retros or just thinking about Michael Jordan again. So it's almost like this, like, anomaly that Jordan brand has been able to kind of latch onto where nostalgia is like the superpower of of Jordan retros, right? Like when when they can get it right with the story and and you know, thinking about like Marcus Jordan and the trophy room ones, right? That's he's done it really well. Like if there weren't so many pairs floating around and and all the backlash that he, you're seeing on their accounts, yeah. man, like they hit a home run with it. Like the shorts are dope. The the storyline is dope. Work. All of it is done really well. And I think it's it's really just a a crazy like I, as someone who r- writes a lot of content, creates a lot of marketing plans, a lot of pitch decks for brands to, you know, market their products to customers. Like you want to be able to 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 recreate what they create with these types of retros that go beyond the traditional sneaker world. And that's massively successful. And in a way that I, you know, almost can't even wrap my head around thinking about, you know, because it's like, like if you search for Carmine's on Google, I'm sure sites that normally don't write about sneakers come up fairly (laughs) frequently within the news stories. And it's like, that's, that's like huge win. Even if the shoes, you know, like I've seen like some, uh, conversation around like the bleeding from the from the red onto the midsoles, and yeah. heard rumors of of potentially the shoes getting recalled because of that. And, like all those things kind of go away once you reach millions of people across different mm-hmm. interests and you know communities. That like it just kind of as much as like there's a lot of us in the sneaker world that are very like specific about what we want out of these things. Or even some of us that are like, you know, okay, cool. Like, I'm glad to see it, but it's not for me this time. It, it, it just supersedes all of the potential for other athletes, in my opinion. And like, how do you ever, how do you ever get to that level with, you know, a LeBron, a Kyrie, uh, you know, like thinking about like what you were saying earlier of like the runway into shoes. Like, I can't really think of, I mean... With LeBron, I could see it being like the seven, eight, nine, something like that. But like, it's almost like it's almost like it doesn't really work in the same way, right? Like, there's just there's just a, a different level with with Jordan that I don't know. It's it's hard to explain for me still to this day. So, yeah, I I think you can probably you know talking about that runway, you can probably do the same thing with Kobe four four five six, then get into the um, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think you're gonna get some. Uh, that's a pretty. That'd be the best comparison. I think of a of a later athlete, uh, with you know more of a tech tech side as opposed to the you know leather and you know old old leather and suede's. But I guess my only question is, and I think it's just because times change, which is it happens especially in the sneaker community. But if I go back to when the I don't remember what year it was. I want to say 2015. I want to say 2015 when the True Blues released with the Nike Air in the back, uh, 2016, when the Jordan 5 uh, uh, Black Metallic released with Nike Air in the back, and then even to when the um, the Infrared uh, 6 is released with the Nike Air in the back, I was able to go in stores, and, you know, may not be a, a ton of them, but there were still a couple floating around. But, I mean, of course, between, there was more floating around of the, Jordan three because I actually saw people putting that one on sale because people weren't willing to play the two twenty five for the Nike Air in the back, but now people become more normalized with the price tag, but also you have more resale opportunity because people are already looking for them early, want to be the first to have it, 
Last Dance effect ratchets up the price of more because we saw that shot, I think, a couple times in the Last Dance, which you're talking about, Nick. And, I mean, I wouldn't. there is a good group of people with a nostalgia purpose to buying, but I feel like it's also, at the same time, kind of getting probably overwhelmed by people looking for more of the opportunity to, ooh, look what I have, you don't have it, and slash, I'm going to flip this sucker for 400 bucks tomorrow. The thing I also kind of want to take, and it's taking a step back to talk about a topic that you alluded to, Mike, and Nick kind of also spoke on, was what was the technical feedback for the 6, 7, and 8s? Were they considered more an aesthetic shoe, or is it the pinnacle of Nike tech at that time? Because to your point, Mike, the 4, 5, 6, we keep hearing about hand-in-hand, hand, that was a performance shoe first, and how it influence and revitalize the low cut basketball shoe mm -hmm. and people say it's a great looking shoe but it's not spoken in the same hushed tones that we always hear that jordan line for and i think that's the oh, one yeah. advantage we'll still kind of have over all these other guys is the fact that we never had anybody to compare to jordan so that's why i think he gets that pass but unfortunately mm -hmm. every person since jordan will unfortunately get compared to what jordan did rightfully or wrongfully yeah now you're right on that yeah and, and i think like I think it's it's hard to it's hard to even compare, you know, the the tech, right? Because it's so far advanced by the time you get to the Kobe 4, Kobe mm -hmm. 5, the Kobe 6, right? The same way that you know, the shoot like the stuff that LeBron is playing, the stuff that KD and and PG are playing in now, it's just next level in terms of everything, right? So oh, for sure at the time i do think that like the jordan was probably still viewed as like the pinnacle of performance but you know at the same time sometimes the jordan stuff just like people never really talk too much about the seven the jordan seven having like the hirachi sock liner right like that right. shoe is just unnaturally comfortable compared to most other jordans up until that point so because the Hirachi sock liner, yeah, the Hirachi sock liner changes the entire vibe of the shoe for for the person wearing it. Aesthetically, it looks it looks great. Like I don't have any issues with it, but like we don't talk about like that specific technology with the same admiration that say we would talk about you know Zoom Air or Tuned Air, or Full Leg yeah. Zoom, or any of those other things. But like if you look back, right, like that that transition from the six to the seven is, is, is a huge leap in terms of like how you actually feel that shoe on your foot. Because if you've ever worn a pair of Hirachi runners or Hirachi basketball shoes, it's literally a sock, right? It, it's like, it's like a, a, you know, to put it in today's standards, right? It's like a padded, like a thick padded SB level cushioning Yeezy, right? Like that just wraps around your entire <laughs> foot. And compared to wearing all the other shoes, you know, it, it just doesn't compare because it, it, it feels like a completely different beast to me. And I, and I think I would, I would relate it to if you ever wore the like 28 or the 28 SE, the 29, those shoes mm -hmm. are like Wait, next nice. level comfort when it comes to just like the way the cushioning feels under your foot, the Hirachi sock liner you know, might not have lasted as long with, with the Jordan line, but like that was that kind of next level feel, especially for somebody who like, like me, I, it's, you know, I was wearing short socks, you know, primarily all the time, unless I had black socks, like the fab five, right? Like if I, if, if I had black socks and, and they matched the shoes, that was the choice. But most of the time I was still wearing short socks, even with Jordans when I was a kid. So, yeah. um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, that's a really fascinating conversation and i think i think something that we should do on you know like a, a series of upcoming episodes is really compare like the 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 journey for each of these signature sneakers right because yeah. there's a lot of cool things that happen you know with each of these models in different in completely different ways for players right like i think that's a, a really fascinating topic but I, I guess, like, I would throw the question to you guys in in thinking about the way 
nostalgia plays into the Jordan line. And like we've almost like moved completely away from talking about the tech of the shoes. How how do you see, you know, we, like we talked about before we recorded, you know, the D-Rose one kind of slipping back onto the finish line site this week. Um, yeah. I am I'm probably one of the biggest D-Rose one fans on the planet. It's a vi- like, again, like I've said this before, but like, don't look to me to create habits when it comes to buying sneakers. Like I literally have probably 30 pairs of D-Rose ones. I rarely wear them, but I just love the aesthetics of the shoe. Most of them, the materials were not that great. But hey, young D Rose, man, I all like that matters. Literally, just like like just binge watch D Rose the first couple of years of his career and tell me you don't walk away feeling high as a kite, just like, oh my god, this guy can do anything with a basketball. At 12 times the speed of everyone else on the court. Like, it's just like the standard operating procedure for D-Rose. Like, oh, you dribbled once? I've been down and back twice. (laughs) Nick, are you looking at my YouTube history? Is that what's happening? Because I'll sit there after we're done recording. And I'm like, all right, let's watch some D-Rose clips. And I literally would do it for like 30 to 45 minutes and just be like enthralled all over again. Knowing I watched these games live, I'm like, holy crap, this man was fast. (laughs) Like and and his and his jump from just like baseline to the hoop over everybody two hand like I'm like all right you you no one could if he was still what he was then if he didn't have injuries he would have been a multiple time MVP multiple time champion and I stand by that statement. Okay, so I've got like eight or nine different thoughts going all over the pop culture. <laughs> I'm. It's funny you mention that, Mike, because I have a definitive D Rose highlight mix because that's what youtube is used for in the malhotra household is to educate the wife and hopefully future (laughs) kids about how great these athletes are with choice cuts of of hip-hop songs as the soundtrack so my favorite d rose mix has the lupe fiasco switch instrumental behind it where i think it was still tipping because you know we're always repping to the fullest and yeah that's one two if they ever do like an Animorph cover version of NBA All Stars, I need that D Rose Cheetah mashup like yesterday. Cause that dude was a cheetah on the court. He was a dude, silent don't killer. Pass. And Nick, you're right. You just dropped a billion dollar idea that I hope somebody in the near future, like if you can binge watch an athlete's career, like that is a fantastic idea. We just have to capitalize oh, yeah. Sign on your me up. <laughs> we, we waxed poetic about d rose i think a couple episodes ago a couple months ago and still i will maintain i've never seen anybody as explosive as he has been on the court and it's funny because twitter sometimes has a way of reading your mind when you don't even know it <laughs> i was scrolling because of the fact that d rose is being reunited with tibbs and we were kind of having the discussion oh is this why that d rose one was released in the chicago bulls colorway and it was one of those things where somebody had posted this video. I think it was the video when he was up against the Heat, and he had two of the fastest dunks I've ever seen oh, against yeah. the Heat team. And you have Reggie Miller hitting Steve Kerr because he's so excited watching this live. And you just don't know what to do because I saw the video, and then the caption that this person put, and I forgot who it is, so I apologize. I'm not being able to give you proper credit. Was you know who your favorite athlete is and you know how explosive he is? D Rose is three times as fast. And Facts. the the best comparison I can think of is when you've got a podcast that you love, but you think that the author's voice is too slow, you put on that 1.4, turn down the <laughs> silence, shorten it. That's what oh. watching D Rose is like. <laughs> God, very true. Man, very I, true. By Friday, I'm probably gonna buy these shoes. I said I hate I hate this sometimes. I love it. All the time, but it's sometimes like you <laughs> jerks make me buy things. I mean, that's that's the thing with the D Rose one though is like, I feel like, I feel like the D Rose sneaker line fell off the same way his injuries kind of forced him off the court, right? And that's... it's really unfortunate because the D Rose one, the one point five, are really great shoes. I think that Adidas should have used better materials on some of the colorways because some of them are definitely not that great. But like the the D Rose two is incredible. The you know kind of ankle strap and like the flexibility of it, especially knowing that he 
was wearing like the crazy ankle supports all the time from Adidas and, and being able to like create a shoe that works for him. Just like super amazing job. And then a- as it starts to grow, you know, like you start to see like, okay, well, you know, he, he wore a lot of like the TS creator line, T- team signature mm-hmm. Adidas line, you know, in the early years and had a bunch of PE colorways and a bunch of really dope, like I- I'll-, I'll grab some and-, and post some pictures in the discord. But um, he had a lot of cool colorways that that kind of like set the tone for his career. But then as the injuries came in and, you know, unfortunately, as like, you know, he leaves Chicago, that whole that whole storyline that, uh, you know, Adidas had kind of latched onto with like the L train colorways and and such Mm -hmm. kind of just became a miss because. Well, he's not in Chicago anymore. So, uh, unfortunately, I think the, you know, the Adidas team could have done better at like elevating the story of him being from Chicago as opposed to just being a player on the Chicago Bulls. You know, like, and yep. and then once you know, I think once a player starts moving around from team to team, it's really really difficult for the signature shoe to kind of keep pace with yeah. you know. It, it's not necessarily even colorways, but just like the nature of of marketing for a player, right? Because, you know, like, okay, like I, you know, I see that he's in Minnesota. I'd love to do a Purple Rain version of whatever shoe he's in at that time. But damn, he's now on his way to, you know, Detroit or back to Chicago or like, you know, New York. I mean, he's just a lot of bouncing around because of his injuries and and people kind of, not really having the full faith in him, yeah. which perpetuates the challenge anyway, right? Like, I think that's why, you know, I, I mean, I I think I'm excited for him to be in New York because, you know, man, like when you're around people that feel like family, it doesn't, you know, age doesn't matter. The vibe is is what matters, you know, with him being in New York with, you know, Thibodeau and like, I, f- I forget who else is there. There's a few guys, right, from that early that? run that he had. Um, yeah, no, there. Uh, Taj Gibson. See, I say Taj Gibson yeah, still Taj- hanging out there. Yeah. 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 Now there is the Back to the Future meme where you have the vanishing family photo, and it's got Joe Kim Noah, it's got Lou Aldang, it's got Taj Gibson, it's got D Rose, and you got Tibbs right in the middle of it. But I do think that what helps D Rose, in a sense, is he's become one of those cautionary tales that hasn't ended in complete tragedy. Mm-hmm. In the sense that we could have easily seen somebody that's in that situation spiral out of control and then he no longer wants anything to do with the basketball, let alone humanity. And by all intents and purposes, I just read up on the fact that he's already let the two rookies know on New York Knicks uh, quickly. I, I always butcher his name and Obi Toppin where yeah. if you guys need anything, I'm here for you. And I think that's why he will continue to stay in that league because of the fact that he has that reputation. He has the mental toughness. And what was once arguably an attitude that we didn't necessarily talk about as much is now his saving grace. And it's what defines him more than that explosiveness, which is something that I think had we had this conversation in 2011, we never really talked much about his attitude or anything, not because it was bad or anything. It was just his explosiveness was so surreal. And that's Mm -hmm. all we could gravitate towards. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well said. I think, I think that's such a, I mean, I know everybody that's a celebrity or a you know superstar athlete at some point has like all these questionable things thrown at them and that try to bring down their character. But like, mm-hmm. you know, D Rose is one of those people that I feel like, you know, getting to do a couple of things with him with the Adidas team around those early years. I mean, I just I just think like he seemed like such a, a genuinely nice dude and. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and not to dismiss, you know, anything that's been, you know, brought up because I, I really don't like know everything in the storyline with yeah. with any athlete because I just don't pay attention enough to all of those things. But I think one thing that's that's kind of um, well, one thing that's always stood out with me, too, like as as my career path has gone, like you guys brought up like Taj Gibson and, and Joe Kim Noah and like, I, you know, if there's anybody listening that's actually been following sneaker history or or me long enough, 
they might know that like that was one of one of, one of my favorite like photo shoots and content creation plays was actually going to Joe Kim Noah's house in Chicago oh, cool. and shooting shooting uh Taj Gibson and, and Joe Kim like around playing pool at, at his pool table. And uh I just think of that as like one of those memories. The same with like uh with with D Rose, like, you know, I I can't remember like I just got so excited, but like him wearing that Louisville crazy eight uh you know colorway because like it was a louisville team color for the longest time and then eventually adidas released it and i I forget if that was like i think that was the same era but it was like a a, you know ended up releasing it finish line and be able to be able to like get all excited that he was wearing it on court and then Mm -hmm. um we actually had a very similar situation ironically with with jeremy lynn like uh jeremy lynn um I'll have to I'll have to grab the the magazine, but Soul Collector exists in China still, right? Like the print magazine exists. Oh, really? I don't know if it still does now, but yeah, it was a it was it was a separate company. The Chinese magazine was separate, you know. Still, same people behind the scenes, but like the magazine existed. And Finish Line, when I was there, was never they never sold internationally. So, um, but I was able to like work with the Soul Collector China team. And actually have Jeremy Lin wear a finish line exclusive pair in uh, like in an NBA game when he was with the Rockets. Um, yeah. And so like like I'm pretty sure it was the the black and red crazy eight. So I'm like all these stories like just continue to loop me back into this kind of love for these guys that. I don't know that we're talking about, but like also just like they have this kind of ongoing, like, you know, vibe and funny, funny enough, we talked about the, uh, the Louis Vuitton boots a couple weeks back, right? That same during one of the other photo shoots that I did with the Adidas sponsored team for the Rockets, when Jeremy Lin was there, Mm -hmm. Dwight was there, Patrick Beverly was there, uh, Harden. Uh, I'm trying to think. I can't remember who else was there, but um, um, Patrick Beverly showed up to our photo shoot in those Jeremy Scott cowboy boots. Like, unfortunately, like, you know, I, I wasn't able to actually have him like in the photo shoots with them on because finish line didn't carry that product. Yeah. But it was, it was just a fascinating thing because like no joke, he was the one of the funniest people I've ever worked with. Like, and that group was just having so much fun that I will forever have like, like all those Adidas athletes through that era of like, you know, let's say 2010 to 2014, 15, I'll forever have so much love and respect for them because of my experiences with them. And D Rose kind of gets grouped into that, you know, from all of the other stuff that we did. So, and all the connection between the silhouettes that they all wore during that time. So that's a, my long winded say way of saying like, I will be trying to resist buying a pair, another pair of D Rose ones. Um, Hopefully, hopefully they go on sale or something. I don't know. I'm looking for a coup. I was wondering (laughs) if they're on Adidas. I'm like, man, I got a $25 gift card. I can like (laughs) get these down a little bit. I'm taking you down with so, the if I'm buying them. <laughs> <laughs> so my 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 last question to wrap this episode up is for the audience and for you guys. Do you think that a player like D Rose as the example, but a player that has gone from being the hot topic MVP, you know, talked about everywhere even had a, a a good little run of success with his signature shoes can ever come back from that and actually be a strong enough signature athlete to sell shoes or, or maybe not even signature athlete. Maybe it's just selling team shoes at that point, but like, or is it, you've already missed your boat in terms of like how the market determines your, your value of, of, you know, signature product and stuff. I think it depends on the person and just the way we've all described D Rose from his skill. I mean, he had a 50 point game in Minnesota and that just proved he still has it in the tank. It depends on what you put him around. We said now he's back with, with old family and friends, maybe boom, we have, we have the, the, the magic potion to get him going again. 
He's in a big market. And, I mean, the X factor here is Jerry Lorenzo is going to have control of Nike. I'm sorry, uh, Adidas basketball now. So we can maybe spark some life. Both Chicago guys, let's, let's put some life back into D. Rose while he's in New York with our Chicago guy. So I think this would make the perfect comeback. It'd probably be the first time you see it happen. But I think it all depends on what is that person going to bring to the table. So if they bring it all back and not give up on a game and not give up on, like, that idea they can still be a star, 100% yeah. If they just kind of sit back and say, eh, then no. America loves a redemption story. And we are willing to cheer anybody on if they can get anywhere close to what we once had in our minds about what made them great. Mm-hmm. It fair. is going to be tough. I think everything D Rose does will come back to the fact that he's never going to scale those heights again, more than likely. And I'll gladly eat the a humble crow if that's not the case. Yeah. I almost look at it as a fact of it may be too much to ask somebody this far along in their career. But I look at a kid like Markel Fultz, right? If Markel Fultz figures it out after coming off yet another tragic ACL injury, I could see him doing that. But I think it has to be that perfect storm of early on in the career, having that right infrastructure. Because I think all these players can be great. It's just who do they get drafted by and who do they get nurtured? And it goes back to a concept that we've beaten kind of to death in this episode, but I'll use it again because we're going to get paid by the word for mentioning the word runway. So <laughs> if I'm player and I have enough runway to go up and maybe there's a little bit of the wobbles and I have to come back down and I still have runway to go up. That is going to be essential, but anything is possible to borrow the Kevin Garnett terminology And I look at it from the perspective of somebody else we mentioned briefly in this interview. Michael Vick, to me, is that gold standard of having that one-year career Mm. year. Because we saw the ugliness with the dogs. Knock on wood, he's shown remorse. And he was granted a little bit of a redemption because Andy Reid, the great quarterback whisperer that he is, said, you know what, I'll take you on as a backup. Circumstances happened. Michael Vick got on as a starter for the Eagles. And that one year... It truly was a turn the clock back type of moment. And it's a question of how much longer can they sustain? Because I'm also of the opinion, if you are away from a game for as long as some of these players are, when they have these really tragic injuries, your body almost recovers faster because you're not going through that day-to-day grind of exercise. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's possible. I think it has to have the right circumstance. And I hope that we do get to see it because we are lucky right now that we live in the golden age of sports fandom because not only do we have access to the American sports, but we have access to global sports because of the internet in a way that previous generations have never had it. So we get to see these unique stories that are no longer bordered up because it's across the pond. So this is one thing that I can say as a sports fan on my bucket list item is watching a player recover from a tragic injury to reach the same level, if not exceed that level. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I I agree. I think those are great points. Um, I, honestly, I'd love to hear what what our listeners think. If that's uh, you know, if you have any other thoughts on that, because I think there's some interesting nuances that we could get into in another episode uh, in regards to the the way that the way that people are remembered, right? Like because you know, I think that's one thing that going back to the start of this conversation with the Carmines, you know, we 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 almost only remember the great things about Michael Jordan. And, you know, that's been, uh, you know, brought into question and and debated for years as to like how that happened or if that was true and all of those things. I think it's a fascinating topic to, that we could potentially go further into. And I'd love to hear what everybody listening thinks, because, you know, it's, I, as you know, Rowett said, you know, Americans love the, the comeback story, I love the idea of, you know, D Rose playing in New York. I text these guys right before we started recording and said, I need a, I need a Knicks D Rose one. I mean, sign me up. Like whoever at Adidas is making these, you know, retros happen. Let, let, let us, uh, let us get, let us get a little, a little nostalgia going, but also, uh, yeah. excitement for, for D Rose's next, next adventure in New York. But, um, that said, 
Thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, guys, before we get out of here, let's let them know how they can find you. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at MadWatcher789, YouTube at Mike Guillory, and if you have a pair of D-Rose 1.5s from that last retro, let your boy know in the size 10. Roy, <laughs> where can they find you? They can find me on Instagram at RoadM13, on Twitter at Roheasy, and knock on wood, I'll be making my sneaker history column debut in the near future. So... Yes, sir. (laughs) Right on. Well, we appreciate you. Make sure you follow at Sneaker History on all the platforms if you're not already. And if you have an extra minute. Where where, where they can find you? Uh, You can find me at at Nick Engvall on all the platforms. Um, But if if you uh, have a moment, drop us a review on iTunes. We'll read it in an upcoming episode. Uh, Maybe maybe even incentivize uh, with some m&ms or some candy of sorts if you're in the discord you can you can definitely convince us to do that so um, that's at <laughs> patreon.com slash sneaker history but anyway we appreciate you all and we'll catch you on the next one peace see you thank y'all